Hallmarks of Health. Uh, this is a wonderful paper in Cell, Hallmarks of Health. Uh, and uh, again, if you look in the middle, uh, middle left lower, you'll see hormetic regulation. And that really is where I want to focus a discussion of uh, nutrient sensing, uh, really mitohormesis as it affects health span and lifespan. So let's move to the next slide. Um, so key energy sensing targets. Um, well, certainly for sensing low energy as during uh, uh, fasting, starvation, uh, excessive exercise, et cetera, uh, uh, key uh, molecules are the sirtuins uh, and AMPK, uh, and that is where I will be focusing our discussion. Um, uh, when I focus on SIRT2 ins, I'm focusing primarily on SIRT1 and SIRT3 um, as they either indirectly or directly affect mitochondrial function. Uh, I'm acutely aware, of course, of the uh, anabolic energy sensing shown in the lower right, uh, where we're looking at the uh, uh, mechanistic target of rapamycin. And it, of course, interacts with both sirtuins, AMPK, uh, as well. But that will not be our focus today. Uh, move to the next slide. Um, the key, uh, key focus of NUCERT has been on the amino acid leucine. And our key finding has been that leucine is an allosteric activator of CERT1 and CERT3. The figure only shows CERT1, which basically uh, causes a leftward shift in the NAD dose response curve, allowing activation at concentrations of NAD that are somewhere between 50 and 80% lower than would otherwise be than would otherwise be possible. Um, and this enables robust synergy with NAD donors, with sirtuin activators. Um, uh, I am gonna, let's go ahead and go to the next uh, next slide. Thank you. So our overall framework is not that leucine is going to be a sufficient nutrient sensor by itself to have a therapeutic effect, but rather that leucine will co-activate other compounds. And in co-activating, excuse me, uh, uh, it will amplify the effects of either sirtuin activators or downstream effectors of sirtuin activators. Um, and like many, I have a theory of everything and my theory of everything, of course, covers this range of diseases from mitochondrial dysfunction to cardiovascular disease. But I will limit my comments today to those that, uh, those that we have data for. Let's go to the next slide. Excuse me. So here, I'd like to spend a moment talking about leucine synergy with NAD donors. Um, you may have seen a fair bit of literature on NAD precursors that can be taken orally, nicotinamide riboside, nicotinamide mononucleotide, uh, as sources of NAD, which theoretically, as activators of CERT1, which have downstream effects on mitochondrial function, uh, should show some of the same systemic benefits shown on this slide. Um, with multiple clinical trials of nicotinamide riboside, uh, in place now, I think we can safely say we do not generally see the benefits that are seen in non-clinical models. What we can say is that these compounds are safe uh, and that they somewhat increase NAD, perhaps twofold. That is sufficient to, uh, that is simply not sufficient or appears not to be sufficient to have glucoregulatory effects lipid effects, lipid oxi oxidation effects, uh, or really effects on any measurable disease state. So our approach has been a little different. Uh, NAD supplements or nicotinamide riboside and nicotinamide mononucleotide supplements uh, can basically increase NAD about twofold. That still leaves the NAD concentration in the fed state well below the KM for either CERT3 or CERT1. 
So our approach is to combine these NAD donors with leucine, fairly high concentration of leucine. And when we do that, as you can see on the right-hand part of the slide, uh, we can show an increase in lifespan in preclinical models, an increase in fat oxidation, insulin sensitivity, uh, in a mouse model of atherosclerosis, the LDL uh, receptor knockout mouse, we can show a reduction in atherosclerotic plaque size, reduction of a, a reduction in macrophage infiltration. And importantly, these are done at concentrations where we see no independent effects of leucine, nicotinamide riboside, or nicotinamide mononucleotide. So we believe we have a means of enhancing the efficacy of excuse me, enhancing the efficacy of uh, NAD precursor, NAD donors. Uh, however, we do not yet have clinical data to support that. These are all from non-clinical models. So if you go forward one slide, uh, we'll take a different approach. Uh, resveratrol has been a molecule that, oh, lost count of the number of papers published on it years ago. Um, uh, again, a molecule that has shown high hopes, uh, has uh, tremendous effects in non-clinical models, uh, primarily as a sirtuin activator. Um, however, the concentrations required uh, are difficult to, obtain, uh, uh, difficult to attain. We have bioavailability problems, uh, uh, essentially due to rapid metabolism of uh, resveratrol. Uh, so we asked the question, could we make the achievable serum levels of resveratrol functional by adding leucine? And what we've done here, uh, this is a quick summary, but what we've done here is we have treated DIO mice with uh, varying concentrations of resveratrol uh, with or without leucine. And when we when we do this, the resveratrol gives us nothing. Um, we are simply, unless we push the resveratrol to very high concentrations, we are unable to get an effect. However, when we combine it with leucine, uh, what you can see in what I consider to be two, two dramatic photographs, uh, you're, you see PET scans of a control mouse in the upper, upper left and in a leucine resveratrol treated mouse, in the lower left, and you can see the FDG lighting up uh, enormously. Uh, in fact, we have a 60% increase in FDG uptake, uh, reduced plasma insulin and HOMA IR by more than 50%, uh, comparable reductions in inflammatory biomarkers, and uh, along the way, a salutary effect uh, on body weight and adiposity. And again, this is at concentrations that have that we cannot, uh, this is at concentrations that show no independent effects uh, when, when not put together in, in combination. Um, the lower right part of the slide simply shows you that in a single clinical trial in pre-diabetics, we were able to improve glucose tolerance, uh, insulin response to a glucose load. Uh, HOMA is, is shown because that's all I had room for in the figure. So this does translate clinically, although we've not taken it beyond prediabetes yet. Can we go to the next slide? So we've also asked the question of whether we can uh, generate a pharmacological approach. And what we've done here is we've put together a combination which we call NSO200, uh, uh, for which we have an IND that's been through a couple of phase two trials in which we are combining leucine, uh, low dose metformin, the starting dose of 500 milligrams, and an extremely low dose of sildenafil, one milligram. Now, the, the point of the sildenafil is not PDE5 inhibition. At very low, con very low doses of sildenafil really do not produce appreciable PDE5 inhibition. Instead, it is for activation of ENOS, which then interacts downstream with both CERT1 uh, and AMPK in a positive feedback, feedback loop. Let's move to the next slide. And so when we, we've done clinical trials in both non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and in obesity in the upper left, what you'll see is liver fat and you see a decrease in liver fat with NSO200 uh, 
in individuals who, who have some evidence of liver disease. Uh, full disclosure, this is a study for which the primary endpoint was not met. That primary endpoint was, that primary endpoint was uh, drop in liver fat in all comers. It turned out to only decrease the liver fat in individuals who had ALTs over 50, which was half of the cohort. Uh, so some evidence of, of liver disease. But even in that study, we showed remarkable decreases in blood pressure, in triglycerides, uh, improvement in insulin sensitivity, and reductions in weight, which led, led us to take, take this forward in a separate IND for uh, obesity. And you see the, for the full co obesity cohort on the lower left, and you can see a nice time-dependent, follow the purple line, a nice time-dependent decrement in body weight. This is in the absence of any lifestyle modification. There were sub-cohorts uh, such as African-Americans that uh, had close to a 6% decrease in body weight, um, uh, but the overall group had about a two, two and a quarter percent decrease in body weight. Again, that is without any lifestyle intervention. Uh, we believe that with lifestyle intervention, which is the normal way you would run uh, an obesity clinical trial in phase three, we will achieve a much larger uh, synergistic with lifestyle intervention uh, decrement in weight. Uh, let us move forward to the next slide. Um, and I'm gonna end on this slide because I'm well aware that leucine presents us with a paradox. And the paradox is leucine is considered to be an activation, an activator of mTORC. Um, uh, and so why do we see the effects we see if you're supposed to be activating mTOR? And the answer is the concentrations that are required to activate mTOR are fairly high uh, in excess of one millimolar. The doses that we give uh, get us to about a half millimolar. Um, it's really hard to get to one millimolar. Uh, fasting levels are around 0.1 millimolar. Uh, levels following a good high protein meal is between a quarter and 0.3 millimolar. Uh, we raise it to about 0.5 millimolar and that is sufficient to activate CERT1 and CERT3 without having any effects on mTOR and we have measured this. Uh, so then how do we explain the observation that it is also a marker for metabolic syndrome in some studies? And the answer there is that when you look at the enzymes responsible for uh, metabolism of, of leucine and the other branch chain amino acids, and especially focusing on, on branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase, what you see is there is a block there in insulin resistant states. And it is the, the buildup of that metabolite, ketoisoproic acid, uh, that really seems to have the effects on mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress. However, high, higher concentrations of leucine uh, have been shown to activate uh, uh, branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase. So we believe this is the resolution to the paradox. But what we can say is clinically, we see the effects that I've just presented. And I think I've run out of time and I've been warned not to go over time. So I'll stop there.